Hey everyone, thank you for tuning in. My name is Cassie Riva. I'm the events coordinator at an unlikely story bookstore in Plainville, Massachusetts. Before we start, a couple technical points. If you have any questions for the authors, write them in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen or in the chat on the side. If you'd like to buy this amazing book, there's a green button at the bottom of your screen that's gonna take you to our website. And when you purchase Constance Sayer's new book from an unlikely story, you're gonna receive one of these very cool autographed book plates from Constance. And Erica Swyler has also signed book plates. So when you purchase any of her books from us, you're gonna get a book plate from her as well. With that said, I hope you're all ready for a discussion about a supernatural secret circus. I am delighted to introduce Pushcart Prize nominee, Constance Sayers, who is sharing her new novel, The Ladies of the Secret Circus, with us tonight. Constance Sayers is also the author of A Witch in Time. She's a finalist for Alternating Currents 2016 Luminar Award for Best Prose. Her short stories have appeared in Souvenir and Amazing Graces, yet another collection of fiction by Washington area women as well as The Skies a Free Country. Her short fiction has been nominated for the Pushcart Prize and Best of the Net. As a media executive, she's been twice named one of the top 100 media people in America by Folio. Constance lives outside of Washington, D.C., and like her character in The Ladies of the Secret Circus, for many years, she was the host of a radio show. Constance's new book, The Lady of the Secret Circus, is a fascinating supernatural work of fiction that readers are going to have a very hard time putting down. It's so good and features a bit of a missing persons case, some romance, family sacrifice, and dark magic revolving around a mysterious circus in Paris. Joining Constance tonight is best-selling author Erica Swyler. Erica is the author of The Book of Speculation and Light from Other Stars. Her, her short fiction has appeared in a Women's Arts Quarterly Journal, and her writing is featured in the anthology Colonial Comics. And her work as a playwright has received note from the Jane Chambers Award. Born and raised on Long Island North Shore, Erica learned to swim before she could walk and happily spent all her money at traveling carnivals. She blogs and has a baking tumbler with a following of 60,000 people. Constance, Erica, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks. Yay. Thank Hello. you. Hi. Erica is joining us from space. Yes. <laughs> um, I'm joining you from the middle of the Pleiades because it seemed really magical and very star-like. And that to me went well with Ladies of the Secret Circus. So I am so excited. Thank you to An Unlikely Story for hosting this, for bringing Constance and letting me read this book. This is the best. Um, I wanted to make sure that you guys got to hear how good this book is and how beautiful Constance's writing is. Um, so if you don't mind, Connie, rather yeah. than me giving a giant spiel about this book, why don't we let people fall into a little bit and yeah. uh, you get to read some of it. So yeah, so the the, pe the part I'm going to read is actually chapter 21. So it's a little bit more than halfway in the book. And so, and don't be alarmed. It's, I'm not going to give any spoilers away really here on this. And um, what, just to set the scene for what this is, is um, Laura Barnes, her fiance is, does not show up for their wedding and she journeys to Paris um, to find uh, out some answers as to, as to why he didn't show up and some other things that, that have kind of popped up. So she gets a ticket mysterious ticket. And so this is kind of what happens as a result of that. So I will uh, just about three pages here. At the foot of the Grand Palais at the corner of Rue Vivienne and Rue Ramire, Laura looked down at her watch, five minutes until 11. The imposing building in front of her was too large to be so quiet. Moonlight illuminated the fronts of the pillars. The waiter at the bistro across the street was stacking chairs in an effort to close. During the day, this part of Paris was buzzing with offices and businesses, but at night it was nearly abandoned. Other than the waiters and the occasional couple on their way home, there was nothing here. She looked down at the ticket and confirmed the streets. The courtyard in front of her was empty and dark. She paced, her heels clicking on the cement. Turning, she thought she heard something behind her, footsteps. She kept pacing. If anyone was watching her, she pretend like she was waiting for someone. She was waiting for someone. She regretted not telling Gaston that she, what she was doing tonight, but she didn't want to worry him or Barrow. After the woman had chased her, she should have been more careful, though she'd cast a protective spell again tonight before she left the hotel. She looked down at her watch again, three minutes until 11. All she had to do was hold this woman off for three minutes. Althacazar would find her. 
The night air in Paris was sticky and warm, giving little relief. Feeling the need to dress for the occasion, she'd worn a black dress with strappy sandals like she was going to a dinner or a concert. Slung over her arm was a denim jacket. And then she heard it again, the clicking of heels, a woman's heels. Laura spun, the noise was coming from the corner near Rue Vivienne, where the street light was out. She felt a chill run up her neck. Come on, come on. She looked around for something to change. Silently, she began to chant, Ricardus locius tegretato, Ricardus locius tegretato. From a distance, she heard a church bell begin to clang. It was 11. As if her vision were bending, she saw the pillars in front of her warp. At first, it was small, like a ripple when you throw a small stone in the water. Within seconds, the smooth waves had become more pronounced, like something was trying to tear through the scene. The streetlights dimmed, making a charge noise as the scene in front of her, the massive building with pillars, gave way. In its place emerged a giant round arena with an opulent gold entrance complete with a devil's open mouth. Laura gasped, the devil's mouth. It was just as Cecile and Barrow had described. Looking back toward Rue Vivienne, she thought she saw the outline of a woman standing under the dead street lamp waiting. She stared in that direction, letting the woman know she wasn't backing down. Straining her eyes in the dark, Laura couldn't make out if this was the same woman from the Père Lachaise. There was a steady hum as if a fluorescent light had just been turned on after a lengthy recess. Four sets of pillars led the way to the door, gaslights illuminating the path. Like a picture coming into focus, the circus with its matinee sign became clear. Laura looked down at her ticket. If she threw the ticket down now and ran, would this scene disappear? Tempting though it was to flee, she stared out at the figure of the woman standing in the shadows. If she didn't go through the doors into the Cirque Secret, then she had to face whatever was out there, knowing it was the woman. No, it was safer inside this circus. Blinking, she took the scene in front of her. The entire circus had just materialized in front of her eyes, supplanting a Parisian landmark. Laura looked around. The waiter at the nearby cafe continued to stack the chairs as though the entire square had not transformed in front of him. Without a ticket, perhaps it hadn't. For goodness sake, get in or get out. Laura looked around the pillars to find a clown holding a miniature version of himself, a ventriloquist dummy, Doro. From Cecile's journals, Laura felt like she already knew him. Yes, you, the clown was, clowns were dressed identically, all in white. From the face paint, to the fez, to the hat, to the costume. Above her, a horse whinnied. Was the statue alive as well? Amazed, she spun around, not unlike Dorothy, who had just entered Oz. Miss Barnes, the dummy's hand pointed to the door. This way, s'il vous plaît. As the clown walked, the dummy peered around behind him. I'm Doro, or he is. The little wooden hand pointed up to the clown who held out his hand to claim her ticket. She was reluctant to give it up. The ticket does not belong to you, snapped the dummy. It was the same dread she felt entering a fake haunted house for Halloween. She expected to be entertained, yet there was a foreboding sense of the background. Laura nodded and handed the larger clown the ticket and watched as it melted into his hand. As she stepped onto the carpet, it rolled up behind her, giving her the sinking feeling that perhaps this ticket was one way. Ah, oh, I but, love that so much. Thank you. Thank so you. that section is, I think, really exemplifies the, the, the mood, the feel of the secret circus, the devil circus, and, and, and what makes and the magic in this mm -hmm. book that works so beautifully well. Um, yes, the circus is just, eh, it's incredibly lush. And what I love about this is that half this book is also really, really grounded in a reality that we understand. What what drives Laura or Lara to Paris is, um, you know, this trying to unravel her family's history that also sort of starts with her fiance's disappearance. Yeah. So, being that you're working in these two separate kind of worlds, this this high fantasy of this 1925 feeling era Parisian circus, and this much more contemporary um, Virginia of, of Lara's current life, mm. how did you weave these two plots together? Like, how does how does meshing worlds work for you? Well, I knew um, that I, I had liked the framework for A Witch in Time, which was a modern day kind of mystery thriller kind of pace. And, I, you know, I honestly just did that because everybody's always like, oh, you got to move, you know, like you gotta, you, your book has to move, the pacing has to move. So I was like, OK, then I'm going to put like something that, you know, there's a deadline they're rushing against. And so in this case, I, you know, um, I, I wanted that that framework of a, of a modern thing happening to a woman so that you could identify with her. Um, and she could be your guide into this world. And so the stakes had to be high. So the, the fiance doesn't show up. Um, 
but then you know the, this the circus not only is it Paris in 1925, but then you kind of enter into another world. And so you've got another world inside 1925. And so there is, um, you know, it, that I think was smoothing that out. And I think you and I had even talked about this. You mentioned something mm -hmm. about, you know, it kind of starts off a little like a, like a thriller. You've got like a detective, yeah. you know, and, um, and, and so I, I kind of wanted that. And so blending it was a challenge and making sure that it, it, it felt you know, I think that was certainly uh, the biggest, one of the biggest challenges in addition to I, uh, journal writing. Journal writing is, <laughs> uh, I'm like, why did I do journals? You know, because like it, it, they never, you know, you, you, you write them. I mean, I started to write them like a journal, like, oh God, this is horrible, you know? And then that was one of the things I think that, you know, making a journal entry blend with this was sure. probably the hardest thing. So it just took like tons of revision and just, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure that I actually got that. I'm mean, glad it was very nice of you to say that I got that right. I'm not sure that I feel that I always did get that blending perfect. Oh, I don't know that we as writers ever feel like we get something exactly right. I don't know about you, but when I'm reading from something, I'm sitting there scratching things out, like skip that, don't read that. I'm still editing even after it's, you know, in print. But I do, there is a real, um, there is a real thriller element to this. And it does mm -hmm. start with, you know, Lara being abandoned on her wedding day, or was she? Um, right. So, by the she way, guys, it is so hard to talk about this book without spoiling it because like all of the best thrillers and mysteries, because it really is a mystery, the plot hinges so intricately. So um, I went back to do a second read of it and got to do, got to see all of the little drops that you do throughout. So it's really just, it's, it's seamless, it is airtight in a way that I think is really exciting for somebody who likes to, to read mysteries and thrillers and really feel a, a build for it. Um, and I do say, you did bring up a witch in time. So I noticed that there is somebody from a witch in time and makes a bit of an appearance in this book. Um, so there is, I'm going to say his name wrong, even though you said it, Alcazar. Alcazar? Alcazar. Alphazar, thank you. Alphazar, yeah. So they're in your in your mysterious um, other dimensional elements. You have this character, Alka, 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 never gonna say it. Alphazar, <laughs> nope, I just can't do it. Um, so do you want to tell people a little bit about him? Because it's a really thrilling character and it seemed like as a writer, you were having a great time with him. And as mm -hmm. a reader, he's really fun to read. So yeah, so he is a very minor character in if you, you, you if you catch him in uh, Witch in Time, he's the um, the demon that um, kills uh, Juliet's mother, and he's the demon that she prays to uh, to curse uh, for the curse. And um, but he, but he but he has a he's a bit player in that, and um, so. I was fascinated with him and I wanted to kind of give him his, I mean, these, these aren't sequential, so it's like his world. Um, he also will make appearance in the next book because I'm kind of a little fascinated with him, yeah. And so he is um, a, a, a demon general um, in hell. And um, I don't want to give too much away, but he kind of, he's the, 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 the demon of what he quote, quote unquote calls really cool shit. And so, and he's just very, um, I mean, he's just fun to write. He's over mm -hmm. the top and he is, I just thoroughly enjoyed him. Now my sister, I'm just gonna, you know, said to me, you know, you wrote about our dad. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, oh no, but I'm like, oh, kind of maybe, you know, my dad was a little over the top like that. He was a Methodist minister. So just go figure out where all this came from. I mean, he can connect the dots on that pretty easily. And um, and it's about, a, I mean, I think at the end of the day, the book is about a father's misguided love. Yeah. And, you know, and yes, he has a very, yes, he's in hell and yes, he's got, you know, but, the, you know, but I mean, and, and just the, the fun I had writing his Wikipedia entry was just, I mean, I, I can't yes. tell you how much I giggled all through that because I thought I it was really say the, the, the almost, I, I don't want to call it ephemera, but the, the books within books mm -hmm. in here are they're incredible you have these journals that you're working with and then there's a demonpedia <laughs> entry that pops up and so there is in doing this you bring in like a larger world into this already like yeah. you know the story that has so many twists and turns and I, I love that because it's just it makes the world more more rich and, and broader and i do think well while you said you you know a struggle to write the journal entries in some ways i think that's just it shows 
your range in such a huge way because it is so different in tone from from Lara's narration. Um, it's so different in feel, and it really gives like a real lushness to the time. And it's also interesting because I think um, you had to stay very close to a character that can be hard to put a finger on, right. Cecile. Cecile. Yeah. Um, how do I talk about Cecile without spoiling things? <laughs> yeah. Like, it, it yeah, tell me about Cecile. Line. It was a fine line with her um, because she's naive and you don't want to hate her. You know what I mean? Because she's right. like almost borderline. She could be borderline stupid sometimes. You know, she's that person you're like, Ugh. and so I, I, there was something that I did with her character that I, I, I think she sacrifices something for the good mm -hmm. of her sister. And I, and, and that had to happen with her. And so, um, but she was a frustrating character to write because she is very sheltered. And so she does like, I, I know there are gonna be some readers gonna be like, it's a sale drives me crazy you know, because they love to do that. But, um, you know, it, 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 yeah, she was a, a challenge. I mean, and then the journals coming from her and she has almost like a, almost like a childlike limited point of view and so she's kind of seeing the world for the first time. She has a very different view of Paris and she falls in love with this um, painter, painter, Emile Giraud, because I can't stop writing about Parisian fake painters. And <laughs> if, there, if there is a little nod, there's a, you know, the guy from the first book, which at the time is in, is, is dropped in this book as well as a, as a joke painter and kind of, you know, and so, I mean, I, I love doing stuff like that and having fun with my world. But, and if you pay close attention, they, they do tie. But, um, you know, she was, that was just a challenge to kind of like make her sympathetic and not um, be annoyed by her naivete. Right, right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the world and the research that you have mm -hmm. had to do for this, because there is, there's, I mean, it's Jazz H Paris. There are mm -hmm. all of the writers there. There are all of the painters there. All of the everybody is there. And there's also this incredibly fabulous world of French circus. Now, my mm -hmm. background, as far as circus knowledge, is totally based on American. So it's from like, Mine goes from the 1700s on just US. So like going to explore this, this French circus was so different. So how did you dig into these historical elements and where did you feel free to just make stuff up? <laughs> well, I would be remiss in not saying the great debt that this book owes to your book of speculation. Um, <laughs> I, and, and there's even a little nod to that with the, so, so when I came upon your book, I just, and I will answer your question, but when I came upon your book, um, I, my birthday is July 24th, and I'm like, who is this woman killing off people on my birthday? <laughs> so this book has, like, for, for um, you know, book of speculation, you, you have something terrible happening on July 24th. And I was, I could not put that book down. That book was life-changing for me. And your story about how you got it, you know, you made the book and how you got an agent. It was just like, it, I sold the book. It was just, was just, I was like, it was so inspirational at a time for me when nothing was going right in my writing career. And I just was like, you know, to, so to be talking to you today with a book coming out, I cannot tell you just how, what an honor it is. But you, you know, you did a really, I mean, you, the historical work that you did, your, your circus came to life. You're right, it was a very American circus and you had the house and you had a, a lot of different elements. For me, the circus and the historical elements I kept bumping up against that when I mm. was doing my research for A Witch in Time. So I went to Paris twice to do research for A Witch in Time, hired a Louvre guide, and she spent, it takes a Louvre guide, it's seven years for a Louvre guide to be able to give tours. That's how, and, oh and so we went to the Musée d'Orsay, she spent the whole mm -hmm. day with me. Um, we went up to Montmartre, we went to Montparnasse, and, 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 and just really got a lot of great stuff. But what I kept running into was the circus, like the circus right. painting of Boom Boom or La Lady La La. And, you know, and, 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 um, and so it was very much a very highbrow right. part of culture. In, and, and, and so you had, you know, some of the great, you know, um, circuses of that time, and you still have the winter circus, which is housed mm -hmm. uh, there. And, and, um, so, and, but it was like champagne and cocktails and women, like almost like the opera. So it was very different than the U.S. carnival yeah. kind of, of, of circus that, that we have uh, in, in the U.S. So, you know, that was kind of fun. It was a little different type of circus. And I, I just remember running into them and, and the visuals on them were just striking and, and mm -hmm. like kind of having that in my background. And I was like, it had like a Wonka-ish kind of thing to it. And I was like, and I'm yeah. really drawn to that. And that's really where it came from. And then I thought like, well, of course he would, you know, Althacazar would, 
have a circus. Why not? And then why he has a circus is kind of the book or the, 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 the reason yeah. for the book. But, you know, it just was something I just kept, you know, as you, and I think you know this, as you start to research something, things kind of come out of nowhere and they're like little gifts and you just kind of file them away. And then, and then it's something that you're like obsessed with right now. Like right now yeah. I'm like all about this. And so I'm researching all about this. But one of the best things that for research that I found uh, was a cookbook. And it was a cookbook oh, really? on the lost recipes or the recipes of the lost generation. And it is not a cookbook. I mean, and so what it is though, it's like Hemingway's beef stew. Um, <laughs> Kiki, Kiki de Montparnasse's Coco Van, you know? And it, it had like the ingredients that were around at the time, very interesting and really kind of uh, important, mm -hmm. but then also the cocktails that they paired with them. And so like, I mean, just the culture in that, that cookbook alone, I use so much of it. I mean, so like, because mm -hmm. I, you know, food and clothing and things like that and painting and art, I think are very, very much a part of, it's not just the history, it's like the, you know, kind of what they're drinking and you know, making sure that's authentic. And so that book was a, was a real like gift. Mm -hmm. And one of the, one of the best things that I had for, to, to write that book. Absolutely. That's the most fun thing about research where you just, you stumble across this one thing and all of a sudden it's like, oh, well, this makes everything work. And I have no idea how, right. and I don't know what I did without it before, but, you know, yeah. and I think on the other end, this world that you've built that Lara lives in when she's not um, mm -hmm. pursuing the secret circus, Kerrigan Falls. So that also feels incredibly real. And I know um, you're in that kind of area of the world now. So do you want to talk a little bit about the yeah. town of Kerrigan Falls and where, where you're drawing your, your information yeah, from, it from this particular? Exist. Good. Yeah, it doesn't exist. <laughs> I love that. Yes. And um, so I, um, I live in the Washington, D.C. area. Normally I'm in West Palm right now, but I'm uh, usually I live in Washington, D.C. right outside. And, um, you know, Virginia has this very kind of cool, like the Middleburg, um, Culpeper area out there. There's a, there are horse farms, there's a, a budding, you know, um, a, a budding wine country. And it's, it, it's really good, it's beautiful. Some of the most beautiful rolling hills. So I kind of did a mashup of Culpeper and Middleburg uh, with mm -hmm. some falls in it. Then you can see the Blue Ridge Mountains in the background. So I mean, it doesn't really exist, but I just, I was like, well, then I'm just gonna make it. Well, I'm already world building. You have to, build, yeah. you know, some more. <laughs> And, um, you know, and, and it's just this weird little town that nothing ever happens in. And there's a reason why. And so, and so then one of the characters that is a police, police chief in a town where nothing happened, there's no crime. And so <laughs> it's kind of, you know, he's a bit of a, of a, of a you know, Virginia Commonwealth laughing stock. And so, you know, um, so I mean, again, like, you know, it just, it, it just was like, I, I felt like that was, and, and that was a part. So I had actually written a book that some of these pieces were from. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know this, book two, no one tells you that book two is horrible. It's the worst. Oh. <laughs> He's like, wait, I know how to do this, but I can't do this. Why can't I do this when I know you how to do this? You have all the time in the world to write book one. Yeah. Book one, you're like, you know, oh, if somebody would just discover my genius. Oh, you know, it's so undiscovered, you know, and, and then somebody fortunately, you know, Does, likes so. it, <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah, I like, likes it and, you know, and you make the edits and you get a book published and that's great. And then you like have this thing called a book contract and there's like another one due. And all of a sudden it's like, do when? <laughs> you're like, Wait, but oh, I did that already. What did I do? You know, and you're like, and so I had like six months to seven months to really finish this book. So I was gorilla about it. I mean, I was yeah. like, I was, I had some characters and I was like, they are going here and this is what's happening. And, um, you know, it, it, and I'm pretty faithful about writing a thousand words a day when I'm writing. And it's, yeah, but that's, I got that from National Novel Writing Month because otherwise, okay. you know, it, and my rough drafts, my first draft, your drafts are probably very good. Louisa Morgan, and I talked about this. <laughs> Louisa Morgan, Louisa Morgan spends time with her drafts. I think her first draft is quite good. Mine's a mess. You know, it's like, oh, I don't want to like yeah. show it to anybody. I always find that the messier my first draft is, the more afraid I am to go back and look at it. But so what is you, how do you get your thousand words a day out? And how do you stick to that? Like, because I have no work ethic. So I'm always curious as to, as to how that process works in your real life, being that you do have like an actual time consuming job, you know, aside from this. I do. I do have a, I mean, a pretty demanding day job I've had for a bit of the same media company for about 20 years now. And, um, 
and I run the whole business side of the shop. So it's not a, a small job. And um, I do think that, I mean, that requires me to have, to have discipline. Otherwise I just couldn't yeah. do it. So I sit down, you know, it used to be in the, in the old days, I would actually write a lot on the cross country flights because we have a fair amount of business in San Francisco and Los Angeles. So I would write, you know, that's a, five hours is kind of perfect. I'd be yeah. locked away and I would just, you know, write, you know, I could write 5,000 words if I needed to. And I remember one night, you know, waking up at the Roosevelt Hotel for a witch in time and just everything kind of came. I like solved problems in my dreams. Like it was like I kind of had things in the back burner thinking like, okay, how am I going to solve that? Woke up in the middle of the night and on my phone, I texted <laughs> yeah, 3,000 words to myself. And, you know, you just kind of, you know, but then I would, you know, struggle to write 500 words and I'd make myself like write crap and I would, you know, like, yeah. Also, you know, like if I can't write something, then I either I'm not inspired and I need to be reading something that kind of inspires me or I don't, I don't have enough research. And so right. you, know, you just keep moving. Yeah, that National Novel Writing Month was a great, you know, teacher for me. And the fact that like you just don't get hung up on your first 50 pages or you're never going to move along. Exactly. And the middle, the middle is actually very important. So uh, the middle is the hardest to write, but it's, you know, it's the thing that you will spend the most time fixing and the most time mm -hmm. that that's where your time should go. But oh my gosh, I mean, do you, do you find that even with every book, there's like something that your editor like focuses on and it's like, you know, like for a witch in time, it was the towel section. Sarah Guan yeah. was not happy with the towel section. And so she was right about that. And then Nivea rightfully so really pushed me, Nivea Evans really pushed me hard on the, on the journal entries. Do you, and, and, and you know, it's I, so worth it. <laughs> So but like, do you, do you find that with your own writing that like, you know, that there's just something that your editor kind of zeroes in on and you're like, yeah, I kind of knew that. Yeah, I think my, I, if I, if I really lean into something when I'm feeling super literary, it gets way too sad to actually be a, like any sort of book that anyone would want to push themselves through. So like my agent would be like, hey, hey, where, where, where's the joy in this? Like, oh yeah, oh, people right. can feel joy, right? Let's find that again. That's something people tend to have to push back yeah. for me. Yeah, but, um, like every every book, there's something that isn't working in the book. Yeah, you know, when you get to the editor, and the editor, I mean, they spend their time kind of helping you work through that. And you know, um, so yeah. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk to you about this book as a book about women, because mm -hmm. we get several generations of you know, uh, women in this family, and we get to see them throughout different periods of time facing different challenges. And it feels like a very, not just a family centric book, which it is, but this, there's this real um, sisterly love through it, even though sisters don't always get along, but in the, the great sisterhood sense. And I know it's, it's dedicated to your family. So do you mm -hmm. wanna talk about writing these women throughout throughout time? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when you look back at both of my books, they have a real feminist bend to them. Yeah. Um, you know, they, um, both of them are quests that women go on. One goes through a quest through time in A Witch in Time, and this one is a quest to the underworld to find answers. And so, um, you know, I, I think that for me, it was really visiting this idea of legacy and what you give um, and what you pass down. And in this case, Laura, they were afraid of their legacy. Um, you know, mm -hmm. Audrey was hiding the legacy and didn't want, you know, didn't really want anything to do with it. Unfortunately, it was having consequences as a result. And Laura is, has the strength to, to go find the answers. And, uh, and the backdrop and the catalyst on it, which I think is kind of interesting, is a, is a painting. You know, it's a yeah. painting that, 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 you know, uh, she goes to have it reframed and the, you know, after this, the fiance doesn't show up like eight months, nine months later, she's like trying to rebuild her life, bought a house and she takes this painting and he says, this could be a very famous painting. It's a, a, a lost painting, one of three about the circus that, you know, and she's like, well, that's my grandmother in that painting and, or my great grandmother in that painting. And, um, you know, and so you, you have just these like, and I think one of the challenges, and I look back on like um, the Mayfair witches that um, Anne Rice did, you have a very similar, yeah. she had a lot of generations, there were a lot more generations, <laughs> yeah. but trying to make each, I remember one of the criticisms my sister had of one of the early drafts was there are too many women, you know, and so like trying to make them very distinct. So, I mean, right. I didn't think there were, I mean, I went back, I was like, but good point, I went back and I tried to make them very, very distinct so that you have 
Um, you, you know, that, that you have Sylvie, you have, you know, you've got like all the different, you know, women. So it's, it's, it's a very, um, you know, you've got Margot, Margot's mad and she's yeah. the poster for the, you know, the Cirque de Margot that, you know, traveled around during the depression you've got in the 1940s. And then you've got Audrey, who's like a Hitchcock blonde and you've got, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I tried to make them very, you know, very, very different so that um, they each had their unique perspective. So did you did you have a favorite one to write who is the most fun for you to, you know, play in, so to speak? I mean, I probably wrote the least on Margot just because I think she kind of served as a, a purpose. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the, the twins were fascinating, you know, uh, Esme and, and Cecile. Um, Audrey ended up being a much more fascinating character than I had originally, she changed mm -hmm. She changed from my original first, I'll just say that, she changed from my first draft of her. Um, so maybe Audrey ends up, you know, so I'm just, I'm gonna leave it at that. Okay, I am gonna say it, full on, I am, lie. yes, I do. <laughs> It's so, yes, it's so hard to not spoil these things, but read on, read for Audrey, do it. <laughs> um, I, I am team Esme in a huge way. And I know if you haven't, I feel like you're going to get a ton of comments about her, but um, I sort of really, I really love personally um, when people write what I will call prickly women. Mm -hmm. And I love seeing people's reactions to that. So I want to know, like, throughout this process of writing, what have, who gave you the most feedback about what characters? Who was really buzzing with people? I definitely think, you know, I mean, again, making Cecile, you know, that balance between Esme and Cecile was yes. really difficult because you have to make, I mean, you know, they are, I mean, I, they just are very different. And they're very different for reasons. And um, so making Cecile naive yet not annoying, and then making Esme flawed yet you understood why. And I think that her story, you can't look at Esme's story and not be heartbroken by it. Right. Um, and I think it's, um, I think she's a very sympathetic character. And I think she is an interesting character. She shows, she's coming back, don't worry. I mean, good. she's she's just she's just too good to not be. She's a chip off the old block, and so yeah. I just you know, I mean, she will be back, and so Excellent. you know that was that was like you know just balancing them that to the point where you you understood where they both fit, and and they and they did not get along, and then you understand why, and you understood the back why and what was missing, and you know, so mm -hmm. that was, I think was the biggest, and that, the feedback that I got, you know, was a lot on there, you know, if if I was too hard on one and not on the, you know, you you needed right. to feel that, so I, I did a couple of rewrites on 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 that. And then also just making Laura, you know, I remember one of the most valuable things that um, Sarah Guan said to me when I said, well, this is a little like Alice in Wonderland. She's like, yes, yes. don't make, and she was so wise about this, don't make Laura a pure observer. Exactly. Like that is, and she has to do things throughout. She needs to react and she needs to change. And so that is something that I definitely, as this information, and that is something that I, that I, I mean, as a writer, I think you know this, you have to, you don't necessarily see it. And then you go back in a draft. And it's like, oh, action, reaction. Action. Right. And I did a lot of that. Like this just happened. And Nivia would be like, well, she said this and this just happened. And I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, you, 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 your editors are so funny. They're like, you know, uh, uh, like but at this point, Nivia is like, seriously, like, you know, <laughs> Like, hey. hmm, are you yeah. sure? <laughs> but She's like, think, so this just, you know, like the world just fell apart and blew up. And she just said, oh, you know, well, you're like, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, okay. Maybe that wouldn't I be think a ultimately for me, that's part of what's so appealing about Laura is that she, she does things, you know, and it, she does grow. But the very first thing that stuck out to me is, well, she buys this radio station. She wants mm -hmm. to start fresh. So she does a thing. And mm -hmm it starts off this theme of music that just runs throughout the book. And it pairs so nicely with the, with the painting themes and the whole arts feel of it. I wanna, mm -hmm. could you talk to me a little bit about the music in this and, and, and how that factors like for you as a writer and you know in your life and, and how it works in the book? Well, I mean, I was a uh, Midnight to Six DJ at WMKX <laughs> FM uh, about an hour and a half outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I'm from. And um, I did that for four years. And it's a lonely, um, a lonely shift, and it's a cool shift. It kind of reminds me, if you mm -hmm. remember Adrian Barbeau and the Fog, 
where she's nice. up in the lighthouse and she's doing that. I remember that and I always thought that was so cool. I mean, you know, and you're learning to spin records and records are so vintage and the way that you kind of like cue them up is like, you know, and I remember really fighting for that scene that you're like, oh, the cueing. I'm like, no, the no. cueing of the records <laughs> must stay on there. You know, and so um, that was just definitely something that, um, you know, was really important to me uh, to have the music in the book because that's what she, that's, that's her legacy mm -hmm. from her dad. Which, right, you know, and that's uh, and that's a legacy that is who she is. So she has a magic legacy and she has a music legacy, and so that I think is something that becomes very important to her as she's. You know, Laura's figuring out who she is. Everything has been ripped, you know, the the rug has been ripped out from under her, and so much of this is her repairing herself and what her yeah. sense of self. And at the end, I think she does a nice balance of that. So for me, though, I mean, I you know, music is very important to me as I am writing. And so as I'm writing a book, and so um, I'm often listening to certain things and, and there's a theme kind of going on with uh, with everything that I'm kind of listening to. Um, I, I do the Apple Chill channel a fair amount when I'm writing because I don't like yep. to hear words. But you know, like um, Satie was very big or like the, for Juliet when she was playing the piano in A Witch in Time. And so, you know, and, and that was very uh, important to me. So I actually did two Spotify um, lists uh, that, yeah, for playlists for all of the music that is basically included. And so if you do like the book and you do like the music, but like, you know, she, I, I wanted to kind of show her expertise in something and her expertise in that she's actually knows how to run this radio station. And she knows she's, it has a very deep musical um, background. And I just, you know, I mean, part of it was just for her character. I wanted that right. to be a, bi a big part of her character and that she, she had courage to do things. She had courage to go on the road with her dad and play the guitar. She had courage to, with his band, she had courage to buy things that she didn't, you know, and just like throw caution to the wind. I liked that about her. And I wanted to make sure that I liked her very much. Yeah. So, yes, that was a big thing. I think it's also important if you're talking about, um, well, demonic culture in the US, that you have to slip in back masking at some oh, point in time, that, you know, know. Oh, which is bad. one of my favorite oh. things that pops up in the book, you know, play a record backwards and there's a secret message in it. And yeah, it is, but. yeah. And, and that's a true story. I went to, I was sent to church, uh, you know, see the earlier discussion about my dad being a Methodist minister, I was sent to church camp. And, uh, and they, um, one of the big things that they said was that we all had to like, uh, you know, everyone was going to bring their ACDC tapes and their Led Zeppelin tapes. And because there was, there were messages from the devil in them. And I mean, and I just oh, remember, I just remember my dad even be like, that is just insane, you know? And so, you know, yeah. So I love that. <laughs> That's, I mean, well, not that that happened, but that moment that it popped up in the book, it just felt like, oh, great. This yeah. is so ingrained in American culture and what we think of as the occult, of course. That it right. Pops up exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there is. And I mean, there's also the appearance of a Ouija board. Do you want to talk about just like Ouija boards and these fun elements that, that keep popping up? What was the most fun thing for you to write that way? Well, I definitely, you know, I mean, I saw this like really scary Ouija board. Um, it, it, the one that I write about, I actually saw it in a, in a. Um, I didn't buy it. You would have bought it. You would have it in your cool yeah. office. <laughs> I, I am not as cool as you. I'm trying to also not have an orb behind my head here. Oh. Um, and um, so uh, I definitely uh, like, you know, it wasn't your Parker Brothers Ouija board. I mean, we spent, oh my God, I mean, as kids, I mean, you know, yep. my, same, my same cousins who were sent to church camp with me for the back masking and, you know, and, and we're also sent, you know, we also had we, the Parker Brothers Ouija board and which was cool and safe because it was a Parker Brothers Ouija board. But like you, I remember going to this um, uh, antique store and just finding this really old, scary looking Ouija board. And that's the one I base, um, you know, based the Ouija board that, you know, that, does some does some work it does, and, it does some cool uh, things it, it yeah it does some cool things and you know and not only that but like you know the back masking and the you know i mean you've got you have this other world trying to communicate with laura and trying to send her messages and i'm sorry that one of the most heartbreaking scenes was the la one of the last scenes i wrote in the book and that was the scene of the gala where she sees yeah. todd and that was a yeah. really heartbreaking scene for me to write because um, I thought that needed to happen. And I thought you needed to have a little bit more of him and a little bit more of what could have been. Yeah, so. you need it. I felt like it was both the other side, so to speak, kind mm -hmm. of just bleeding through, which is right. sort of what that bleed through with whether it be like Ouija mm -hmm. boards or back masking or that scene at the mm -hmm. gala bleeding is what through, makes yeah. it, it what it's what makes the, the actual circus when she's in it 
work because you've yeah. seen it just kind of filtering through and you have these ideas that, um, you know, this world is, they're right next to each other and right. they touch. Yeah. Um, one really fun thing. Um, so I've watched, everybody. I've, I've watched much too Supernatural. The, the, the oh, television yes. Show. <laughs> tell, Same. <laughs> Same. <laughs> I mean, Sam and, and Dean, Sam and Dean, you know, and that Buffy, and Carnival, yeah. that and Carnival. Oh, I felt like God. with yeah. Carnival, I felt like um, you could be in this world that was, you know, based in reality, but all sorts of these these things are in fact bleeding through with strange things going on. So right. I felt like I felt quite at home in your book because of that. Yeah. Um, one last fabulous thing about your circus: it is populated by famous people, but we don't really know who. Um, well, one of them you do know. And it's kind of a trip. Do you for yourself know who every single one of these famous people who are trapped in this circus are? Yes. And and would readers be able to find out if they read closely? I think so. Like you have the 27 Club, you've got a couple of people from the 27, the 27 Club being yeah. people, famous people who died at the age of 27. So that's Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin. And um, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm having a senior moment, but yes, I mean, so anyway. <laughs> Many more, and um, Keith Moon, I think, uh, yeah. and so you have um, Mama Cass. I mean, I think she was also twenty-seven. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. crazy when you start to add them all up. It's just crazy. And um, I mean, I'm just like a kook about stuff like that. I remember, you know, at the Roosevelt Hotel, I, I you have two blocks north of the Roosevelt Hotel is the hotel where Janis Joplin died, and of course, I had to like go. And you know, I mean, I love like the like, stuff like that. That's a little macabre. But I, I really, I'm, a, I'm like drawn to that, and so that mm -hmm. was you know, something about like when I'm traveling, I'm always looking for things like that. Um, so yes, I think that you can definitely, I mean, you know, Paganini is there for sure. Yeah. I mean, I, I okay. Nic yeah. Nicola, Nicola is named, yeah. you know, and I, mean, I think some of the fun are like looking around um, for that and, you know, and, and I'm going to leave the identity of the circus monkey. Yeah. Uh, for readers, keep your favorite. eye out for the monkey. Keep your eye out for the monkey. It'll crack you up. It'll I, just crack it, you up. It, it cracked me up. Yeah. Totally. It's yeah. very good. Bravo on that monkey. Um, so last couple things I want to ask you before we um, drop it to the audience for questions. What have you been reading? What do you recommend? And and what is feeding you during these weird yeah. times? Yeah, so um, we put together a list. I think it's going to be like both Eric and I put together a list of some of the things that we're reading and we think that you would like. So I do think they may come in the show notes. We'll have to talk uh, to, yeah. to the host here and see. I, I these violent delights by by Chloe Gong I'm loving right now. All that glitters by I think it's Gita Trelease. It's G I T A T R E L E A S E. It's a really great book. Um, All that glitters and it's a like a three part series. And the Hazelwood by Melissa Albert. If you love worlds like Melissa Albert's uh, Hazelwood, it's also a series. is is a is a is a great book and you had a list oh yes here it looks on. yes oh perfect so yes the links are in the chat click away um so what i'm suggesting is if you are into gothics ghost stories and the idea that every love story is a ghost story and every ghost story is a love story please 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 pick up chris walder's the lost history of dreams it is very cool um it's about that's the post-mortem photographer right yes it is about oh. a victorian post-mortem photographer and I it mean, involves it involves like my favorite thing is the, the twist on the you know victorian trip of oh a woman trapped with a sprained ankle no the guy sprains his ankle and everything just falls love, to pieces and you it's gotta love that beautiful chris writes poetry in it it also has journals and letters and it's it's just lush and i think it pairs really well with this um i'm also going to recommend the chosen and the beautiful by Neve Yo, I think I'm saying that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and that is a new take on The Great Gatsby as written from the perspective of Jordan Baker, who is a Vietnamese American and it is tinged with magic. They drink demonic, which is like cognac, mm -hmm. but demon. And uh, oh. it involves Vietnamese paper cutting magic and it is incredible. It's just a take that we have, that I've not seen before and it's really, just lush and terrific. I'm going to say it's getting lush great. It's again. getting great press yeah. too. It's great. Yeah, it's just um, it, it is a a new look at something that requires a new look, and I think it will reach a lot of people. And so I'm very excited about it. And that is a pre order. And out now is Body of Stars by Laura Maynard Walter, which is 
Okay, the premise of this is that people can tell their fate by reading the birthmarks on women's bodies mm -hmm. as they come up as, as, as they reach uh, maturity. So you, okay. you hit puberty and the birthmarks show up and all of a sudden everyone knows your fate. So wow. it becomes this real binary of what's possible based on gender, based on fate, how do you determine things? And it's really beautifully written. Um, there's tarot involved as well. And it's just, it's, I wanna say a world just next to ours. And um, it makes you think about, um, makes you think about gender and fate in the same way that the power did. Um, yeah. So I highly, highly recommend it. So those are those are my my book recs and um i'm happy to take questions from folks yeah. if you have them i hope you do otherwise i can talk to you about <laughs> forever like actually why don't i do that um no honestly because so how i know you were butting up against circus as you were doing your witch in time research but mm -hmm. I have learned through researching circus myself that there is always a ginormously weird fact that tickles you pink but just doesn't fit in the book. So, like, what was what was your the, the oh no? Book? I put it in like put Claire, it in. Claire Helio, because Claire Helio, the the woman that was the the lion tamer that would basically I think she did end up getting maimed by one of her mm -hmm. lions. Um, she would have tea with them on stage I mean, what, what what a victorian no. like thing to do and they would sit and they would she had them at tables and they would sit and they would eat you know they would eat meat and drink i mean I, they wouldn't drink tea obviously they were eating meat but she right. was having tea with them and i don't think it went well you know yeah sort of, probably probably not things often don't I you, know? you know cats will put up with stuff for just so long and then what, yeah, we're done. Done. what was your fact? But I actually put mine in because I'm like, that's yeah, really weird. Oh, yeah. gosh. So, yeah, I wound up because so much stuff from circus is really, is, I don't know, it's just weird and out there. And especially um, with early American cir circus, half of it got split up with um, menageries. So you yeah. tour with animals and weird, stupid human tricks right. as well. So people would tour with counting pigs. Um, they were counting pigs before they were counting horses. And oh, for some like reason, yeah. And for some reason, every counting pig, every learned pig was named Toby. I don't know why, it just became tradition. So if you want to have a smart counting pig, you name it Toby. <laughs> I also realized, and this I got from reading your book, I didn't realize that there was such a strong equestrian tradition in the French yeah. circus. Well, because, and in the Americans, I mean, the Americans, yeah. they started off as like, you know, that was, I mean, you, you know, it, it was, it, it, I mean, I think the, I think that Barnum and Bailey could have started off that way, didn't they? It was, it was, a, they it, was did. A horse, it was a yeah. horse to do. They did. And they had, before they started, you know, moving around and having, having their long trains and whatnot, they had stable circus buildings right. and they were basically, you know, riding arenas and whatnot, because um, I guess the first person who brought the idea of circus here was a British equestrian. So yeah. I always want, I want to know, like, were those, how those tricks transferred? And remember the transfer? elephant, the British elephant made his way, <sighs> what was his name? It wasn't oh. Jumbo, Jumbo, it was Jumbo. Yep. Jumbo made his way here and then, you know, he was a star in England and, and one of, and we bought, uh, he came here and ended his career here, you know, but like, I love those kind of like, you know, and, and definitely even like if you, um, the, the racehorse that I had in, you know, Witch in Time, I love, I mean, some people may get annoyed by that, but I like love to like weave in like, you know, like far, far lap the horse that they brought from Australia that right. died seriously and, you know. And I, I love that kind of stuff. So I mean, you have to put in something that you know tickles you. Yeah, you got to put in something that tickles you pink. Like I guess in my last book, I had to do a whole bunch of research on stuff I barely remembered from the '80s, and I was like, oh, I wonder if like so I made up something that had um like a, a My Little Pony in an astronaut suit, and then of course I found it, and I was like, oh, cotton candy, cotton candy got the astronaut yeah. suit. Yes, so that goes in. If it, if it doesn't matter to anyone else, I don't care. It tickled me pink. Yeah, but. exactly. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, I mean, you got to, yeah, you, you, your book has to delight you a little bit. Yeah. But, so, um, so I wanted, to, I also want to talk about the horses in this book because horses are such yeah. a huge part of this story. And, you know, is that, do you have experience with them or because you write like you do? Oh, and I have how did, with them and that they hate me. Oh, <gasps> really? <laughs> oh my God. I've taken so many writing class, like writing lessons and stuff. And they just, 
I mean, out in Virginia, I mean, I've just, you know, I, yeah, I admire them. I think they're beautiful creatures. And my sister, big horsewoman, but I mean, I, you know, and I'm, I love, I mean, I have dogs. I've got two dogs. I'm a big, you know, and I, here's me like, I'm like, okay, it's like a bigger dog. No. And, <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I couldn't get that, that horse to do, and I mean, like, you know, anything, you know, and right. I, apparently I got the stubborn horse and like that just, you know, was, you know, but then, you know, like my sister, when we went to uh, uh, Vienna, we went to see the Spanish horses and, you know, the, the show for the, what they live in Zyner horses. And, yeah. you know, so, I mean, I, I'm around horses a lot with her, but I mean, I just, I, I, you know, they kind of terrify me a little bit now because I haven't had some great experiences. So I, I, I have, I'm in awe of them. <laughs> yeah. But did I, you, you know. Did you get to see anyone do that kind of trick riding or anything? I mean, yeah, I've certainly seen, you know, uh, you know, carnival shows and things like that, like yeah. much more American carnival shows. Uh, I tried to see the Winter Circus in, in France, uh, just to even go to it, and I couldn't get in. Um, yeah. it was, I was there in the summer, and, you know, even though they were, like, there to practice, they had a uh, they had a traveling car, though, and I did get to kind of see that a little bit. And so, um, you know, that's kind of the loose basis for, like, you know, the – the, the traveling car that they have in the, in the other circus. And so, um, you know, I, you know, you just try to, a lot of what I've picked up is from Cirque du Soleil as well. I think Cirque du Soleil yeah. does a beautiful job. I mean, it's got that kind of, you know, really beautiful. And so all the aerialist stuff, you know, comes from Absolutely. there. I, I did sign up to take aerialist classes. <laughs> I break. <laughs> I just, that, that just terrified me. I was like, oh God, you know. So. Yeah, you put me on heights, and and I need muscle. No, that's not yeah. happening. I will I'm, gladly yeah. watch. I'm like not Marlon Brando with a method acting thing. It's like, no, I am not gonna like you know be the aerialist. So yeah, right. So what was the method acting part of this for you? Like, how deep did you get you personally into doing any of this stuff? Well, I mean, certainly for me. I mean, I, you know, where I was on my home ground was the were the painters Montparnasse. I mean, I'm a big, you know, I mean, I that's probably my favorite part of Paris, and and um, it was a big last book was you know kind of I think a take on No Exit from Jean Paul Sartre, and so mm -hmm. obviously that was his you know stomping ground, and so I've spent a lot of time in in Montparnasse and Montmartre. And, you know, so, so I was kind of home free with that, I think, that aspect. And so, you know, for me, I mean, I think just, you know, the, the, the biggest challenges and the biggest, you know, um, the, you know, were just kind of the circus elements and the, you know, yeah. but even that wasn't, you know, that wasn't traditional like circus. That was a lot of theater. There was a lot yeah. of like, it was show and theater and like things that were, you know, I did take some elements of like Cirque du Soleil from there and the aerialist and, you know, um, uh, but you know, like it's its own thing too. I mean, there is a real, there is a real carnival aspect to it yeah. um, because it's there, yeah because there is that element of danger to it, and I think danger, danger lives in the carnival. Which and you have, have to know. Yeah. yeah, and yeah, and I write about that, which is that like half of what you're viewing is the the ability that you know they could slip or they could you know and yeah. it, you know and there is that kind of fascination. I think that's why we do you know view things like that, and so. I am fascinated with this whole kind of, you know, Victorian, like a cult and, you know, yeah. uh, like stage things. And like, you know, so you kind of had that almost in this, in the circus as well. You kind of had this like fantastical thing, but the thing is I couldn't really method a lot of that. I, I mean, you right. know, the thing about this book is I couldn't really method a lot. I had to like extrapolate and kind of go into something that was like really subconscious um sure there are rules to it though which is i mean for those listening this is the sign of, of magic that works well is when you can see the rules and they make sense so there are lots of there are lots of rides in your in Everything your circus and upside down yeah and i think that that very much it very much works and it, it makes a lot of sense and it also makes a lot of sense as far as how it communicates with the paintings that you're talking about and the eras that you're talking about because you have surrealists popping up and I feel like the surrealist art of the time plays really well with the circus itself which yeah because I mean there's this line where she basically you know where Hemingway asks her how how, how she's pulling off the trick mm -hmm. you know and he thinks that you know, I mean, you know, they they think that she that it's a surrealist act, and you know, so there is this like you know mystery, which you know, I kind of wanted that like 
was it real? Was it not? You have this like pursuit with Laura and an art historian uh, who has spent his entire life trying to find the answers to what was the secret circus that existed for two years in, in Paris. And you have, you know, the, you know, people wrote about it. I mean, they didn't really, it's obviously you know, a bit like, you yeah. know, Matt Hemingway and those guys, you're talking about how it was a surrealist performance art. And I kind of like that because like, you know, I mean, I think they would kind of think that. I mean, you yeah. would if you have this like, like strange thing that kind of appears that like, you'd be like, okay, well, what's the trick? How are you doing it? You know? And uh, cause the alternative is- Yeah, accepting things as reality is a little bit scary. Yeah. <laughs> a little not, a little not so, okay. Yeah. So I also think um, the thing that really, or one of the things that took me about this book so much is it becomes, it becomes a real story of obsession. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and I love the way that grows throughout your characters. I mean, Laura is obsessed with, you know, at first it's finding out what happened to her fiance who didn't show up. And then it becomes, you know, what is her family and what is this circus mm -hmm. for for Ben, who, by the way, Ben, oh, my heart. But oh, thank what a, you. Yeah, no, he's great. He's the uh, he's yeah. the police that doesn't do anything. Right. <laughs> Ben's Ben sort of becomes a bit obsessed with Laura and it's mm -hmm. it's lovely and then we have the people who are obsessed with the secret circus and and the paintings themselves and normally i find people are really tempted to have obsession lead to utter doom mm -hmm. and i found that it was really unexpected in some ways that it doesn't do that in your book and i was wondering like how did you how did you turn that on its ear well, I, you know, one thing that I'm a little obsessed with myself is I, um, you have that um, Missing Mara Murray podcast. I was listening to that yeah. about the time that I was writing this. And what I find very interesting about that, that whole thing, and I, I tried to get this with Todd, is the first obsession, which is that you have this, a missing person is a very interesting thing because you get people fill in the answers and there comes this entire like infrastructure and superstructure that forms from the finding. And so I loved the idea that, um, you know, you had these people camping out at the devil's bend to find out what might've happened to Todd and what might've happened, you know, and then you have Laura, Laura's quest um, at all costs. I mean, I mean, mm -hmm. she really goes into that, that, that part I read, she goes into the circus thinking there may not be a way back out. Um, and then you have Teddy Barrow, Edward Binghampton Barrow, right. who is, um, uh, you know, a, a, an art historian who has spent his entire life trying to find out. And he, he says, I basically had to write books on Emile Giraud and leave them blank because like no one really no knows, knows what happened, you know? Yeah. And so his pursuit and his obsession is it dovetails so beautifully. And that was not something that I had had in the original book. Beryl was a very minor character and he ends up becoming the yin to her yang in a, in a real way. Yeah. At the end, I love the letter he sends her, the email he mm -hmm. sends her, um, which is about what happens when the quest is over. Yeah. And I think, I you think, know, the, yeah. the mysteries and the, you know, are mysteries fuel things, mysteries fuel, you know, um, and so just, you know, I, you know, I, I, I listen to a lot of the like, you know, mystery podcasts and things. And you just find a lot of like things are set up around not having answers. So you fill in yeah. the gaps of the answers. And I'm, I'm quite fascinated by that. And I tried hopefully to have that in this book. Ah, so seeing things pop up over here. I know. I want yeah. to. They're so sweet. <laughs> you guys are very sweet. Thank you. I'm going to pop uh, back on the screen. Excellent. <laughs> This was so. This I can't believe it's already been an hour. I know. I can tell. Really, the fastest hour ever. Um, this has just been such a delight. Thank you so much. Uh, Constance, your you. book is amazing. Oh my God! It's back at this, you. They I don't mean, judge I mean, a book by its cover, but like, it's look beautiful. It's amazing. The Red, Hook, Red Hook Orbit folks are. I mean, just you're just gonna leave it on your coffee table because it's just so it's pretty. So click that green button, order a copy of the book. You're going to get an autographed book play from Constance. And Erica's books are all listed in that same link. And you can get an autographed book. You got to get, well. get Book of Speculation. It's a, it's the companion to Ladies of the Secret Circus. You got to, you know, they, they go to, they, 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 they go together. American Circus. Hi, bro. Everybody. We'll just call it everybody. 
Virginia, yes. you know, Long Island. I mean, Long Island, right? good places. I have to say this book would make an amazing mini series oh, on the CW or Netflix. I'm so glad you brought up the supernatural because when I was I reading this, like from the opening scene, I was like, I know I shamelessly sent it to the, to the, to the, the creator of Carnival. Cause I'm like, you've got to look at this, you know? Yes. So, so good. Thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you everyone for tuning in. Have a great night, everyone. Thanks.